All right, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Norbert Majerus, uh, who has a fabulous new title that I'm going to let him share with you when I turn it over to him. So thank you for joining us today as he gives us a brief overview of why lean of innovation is important. And I hope you like what you're hearing because we'd also like to host a workshop with him in June, on June 15th. And we have a couple of lean innovation topics that we could choose from. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer. But now I have a problem. Before I uh, had my screen uh, share, uh, I had my screen up there. Thanks for joining uh, today. I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to share some of my uh, thoughts here on uh, using um, uh, the, the thinking of lean or uh, actually operational excellence and applying it to, uh, to innovation. And I want to start with a, um, a picture here. Uh, this is the first digital camera that was, uh, that was ever made. And um, I don't want to uh, waste your time asking you who made it. Um, it was actually Kodak who made this in 1975. And uh, that was 10 years before the next competitor was able to, uh, to uh, make a product like that. Now I ask you, where is Kodak today? Okay, Sony here, uh, you know all about Sony. They, uh, they make today the best digital cameras that are uh, on the market. And uh, you wonder what happened to Kodak. Um, and I like to show this story because um, it, it shows that uh, it's not the product or it's not the ideas that make you successful in innovation. There's a lot more to it. And um, uh, the few facts here, the average age of Fortune 500 companies is now below uh, 10 years. And um, 52% of the companies uh, that were there, the Fortune 500, that were there in the year 2000 are now gone. And the reason, uh, and I think there's pretty much agreement amongst all the experts on this, it's the failure to capitalize on innovation for, uh, for most of them. Because there are two key factors for industrial growth. If you wanna grow um, your company, the first one is population growth. Yeah, but that has kind of slowed down and uh, we can't really count on that. But the second one is the market growth. And you grow your market by either uh, getting more market share, you make a better product, you make a cheaper product, or you uh, make something that nobody else has. And that's what's called innovation. And um, a survey of the Fortune 500 CEOs, I don't remember in what year this was done, but 90% uh, cite uh, innovation as a key to future success of their company but also at the same amount of CEOs whine about their ability to do innovation. And I think I have some uh, encouragement here for those because I show you a very simple, very simple process to be successful uh, with innovation. Uh, my definition of innovation, you got the, the, the red line here, that would be your current product and all of a sudden, uh, uh, there is competition, it, it's kind of getting outdated and uh, you now have to drop the price to keep selling it. That's when you bring out the new product. And if you don't bring it out, uh, in most cases, your competition will bring it out. Anyway, if even if you, um, I mean, uh, let's assume uh, you, uh, you're lucky enough and hit the right, uh, the market at the right time and you're on your green line and uh, keep making money. If you're on the red line, uh, this black arrow shows you the difference between having a new product and not having the new product. And trust me, that amount of money can be absolutely huge. I've seen that uh, at Goodyear when I worked there being millions of dollars a month that the company wasn't able to, uh, to collect uh, because we didn't have the right product out there at the right time. Uh, this is the traditional value delivery model you are very familiar with. Uh, you, uh, uh, for example, uh, you buy a new car and the minute you drive it off the lot, uh, your car is starting to lose uh, value. Uh, we also know that those uh, cycles have come uh, very close uh, together now. And we also get used to continuous value delivery. Like for example, you may not know it, but uh, Windows updates on your computer all the time. And uh, there used to be formal upgrade cycles uh, for software makers 
but uh, now they pretty much release a product after every scrum cycle they do. So uh, a new way of delivering the, the innovation and uh, that becomes more and more popular today. But I want to talk to you about uh, this picture. You all know the, uh, we're, most of your companies, uh, we are in global competition. And uh, you see these containers, uh, they could come in or they could uh, go out. And uh, there's still a lot of debate about it. Uh, some people think that uh, uh, automation has cost uh, the US more jobs than, uh, than any uh, uh, outsourcing to, uh, to lower labor countries. Uh, uh, but I believe that the lean thinking can bring a lot of these uh, jobs back because uh, companies, it doesn't matter where you are, you should be efficient enough to uh, to compete with anybody in the world. But I want to talk about this piece, the intellectual work. It takes nothing to outsource intellectual work. You get computers in every country. And it, it, believe it or not, the talent is there in other countries. And uh, I was part of outsourcing engineering services uh, to India. Um, uh, at one time, Goodyear wanted to build an uh, innovation center in China that, by the way, uh, was not built. And um, for me, there is a remedy to keeping intellectual jobs in this country. And it's just simply becoming the best at what we do and the best at how we do it. And then and, uh, you can compete with everybody in the world, regardless uh, uh, of where it is. But there are challenges to it. The product life cycles have come down drastically. Complexity has gone up uh, uh, at the same rate. And uh, for me, the most important thing is this curve, the, the R&D spending, the amount of money that is available to do innovation. And th that has not kept pace with anything. At Goodyear, it was flat. Uh, 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 during the time that I, uh, during the last 20 years that I worked there, and I bet you it's still on that level. One of the most profitable German car companies showed me their uh, spending curve, and it has been flat for, oh, for more than 30 years now. So really, we have to get better at what we are doing, but we are not going to get any more money for it. So um, as I said, become the best at what you do and how you do it and um, uh, try to keep the budget uh, flat at the same time. And it can be done. And uh, here is where my story uh, begins. Here's uh, the story in my new book. Uh, it's about an um, Italian, uh, uh, very famous Italian cyclist. Of course, he never lived. I invented him. I called him Fausto Davanti, and he won all the races, uh, the big bike races in the 50s and the 60s. And he took the money to, um, uh, to uh, create a, uh, a bicycle company. And here's the bike that uh, Fausto probably rode at that time. Today, um, uh, his uh, Fausto son is running the company and they make the best bicycle that money can buy. I mean, it's the Ferrari of all bicycles. Uh, it is uh, technically uh, perfect. But there are a few things that bother um, uh, Fausto uh, Jr. here. The bike looks about the same than the bike his father rode uh, uh, 50, 60 years ago. So where's the innovation, he says. But then also, uh, this is a problem that he has. Uh, the, the cost to win bicycle races has gone up and uh, uh, the, the, the curve, they, they don't win any more races. And at the same time, the profit of his company has dropped very significantly. So here you are making the best product in the world and uh, you've done it for so many years and he can see the writing on the wall. Um, this is not good because he wants to retire in a few years and the value of his company erodes uh, every day. So I'm teaching uh, Fausto in my new book, how to uh, win uh, in innovation, how to get back to winning, how to leave the competition behind in the business, the same way he's used to having his race team uh, leaving the other guys behind in the races. And of course, for Fausto, the, uh, the tangible thing is to double the value of the company less than uh, two years, because that's what he needs to do uh, uh, to, to retire. And um, uh, for Fausto, this becomes, uh, the, the innovation becomes R&D driven. And not only for Fausto, 
I believe that that's uh, uh, still the, 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 the model. And this is something I don't know. I learned this from Toyota and uh, we, we do everything Toyota does like uh, TPS and so on. But I think this is a fact that's not so very well known. Toyota says that 95% of a vehicle's profitability is determined when the vehicle is designed. And uh, so that's where I want to put uh, the lean thinking. And how can we make the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the product that we are designing uh, uh, more profitable by applying, uh, by applying lean principles? And also it has to engage the whole enterprise. This is not limited to, to R&D. And here's an illustration of what I'm talking about. The, uh, you see the typical cost of a company here. And R&D is a very low cost between two and five, six, seven percent of the, of the total uh, cost. But uh, I also show the shadows here. The shadow is the indirect influence on profitability. And you, that's where I want to put the 95 percent of, of the Toyota thinking here. And really, I like to apply lean thinking to this shadow. How can we apply lean principles and help the company um, make more money or whatever the company's uh, main goal uh, might be? And the Fausto also learns that winning innovation is the perfect balance between the process and the culture. And, um, uh, but I want to start with the process now and I get to the culture a, a, little bit, uh, uh, a little bit later. So let's talk about the process. There is not one innovation process, but uh, uh, in my book, there are three innovation processes. You have the creative piece, then you have the technology development, and then you have what I call mass design. And I give you a little um, a couple minutes on uh, each of them. So let's start with the, cre uh, oh yeah, there are totally different uh, drivers for these different phases. And uh, for, for example, uh, the fail fast and fail often, I'm sure you have heard about it. That for me applies the best at the creation piece. That's where you want to try thousands of new things, but don't get stuck on one. Then for the technology development, it's all about the efficient knowledge creation. And for the mass design, here is where you have already printed your brochures, you have ordered your tooling, maybe you already have your, uh, paid for your tooling. Failure is not an option anymore. Anything that comes out of that phase has to be uh, like uh, manufacturing, like lean manufacturing on time, uh, on budget and all that, uh, all that uh, good stuff. So we'll talk about these separately. And for me, the creation, my mental model about the creative part is a company, a fashion company called Zara. They, uh, that's a Spanish company. And uh, the, uh, at the beginning of every uh, fashion season, Zara, uh, uh, what you call fashion designers, or you may call them engineers, they design thousands of new garments. And then there are people around the, the company in Spain, they uh, hand saw two or three of each of these garments. And then they throw these garments out in the store, or in the stores, all over the world, just two or three uh, uh, each. And then within days, Zara knows what sells that season and what does not. They, uh, when they can uh, see what, uh, what stays on the shelf and they, they know what sells, but they also watch people uh, 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 and uh, they uh, put these new garments in the window and they watch who stops for them and how many people stop for them and uh, so on. And then within two days, Sarah knows what sells. And one week later, they can have that article mass produced in the stores. Now, if we do uh, services, if we do products or whatever we, uh, uh, we, we design and uh, sell today, uh, uh, we may not get to two days and the one week of mass production, but the closer we get to that thinking, the better we're going to be. And uh, this is all about speed and agility in this phase. The more you try, the better your chances. Try thousands of things, but don't get stuck on anything. And you never know until you try. Something that killed me when I did innovation. And by the way, I have uh, 60 patents 
I did my innovation um, in a share of innovation. I spent almost 40 years in innovation. Uh, the accountants always wanted to know well exactly how much is this going to cost. And manufacturing wanted to know exactly what it would take to manufacture. And I told them, I don't know. This is just an idea. Oh, well, then we don't want to hear about it. Well, you never know until you try. And Sarah tries. They try it on thousands of new articles. Then follow the risk curve. I have an example for you for that. And then do it fast. And I uh, also show you an example of uh, good is good enough. Uh, this is a, a very famous uh, little picture where, you de where they developed uh, uh, the, 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 the iPhone. And uh, they didn't need a phone. They just uh, scrolled paper through it to, uh, to let people um, uh, understand how this uh, would look like in, uh, in real life. You did not need a fully blown phone to, exp uh, to experience this. For me, i like to show you this example happened uh, on my shift at Goodyear. Uh, we had uh, this uh, brand new material. It was recycled material, and we put it into a new tire. And um, the traditional way would be you start a project, you develop the tire, give it to marketing, and then um, give it to manufacturing and then see if they can sell it and then see if manufacturing can make it. But that's not the way we work anymore. So we had uh, tested the material in the lab and uh, found the material um, uh, very, very uh, suitable. And we were convinced we can make a great tire. This. So I asked the people, what is the most critical question here? And uh, everybody agreed um, uh, it is, um, uh, the most critical question is if we can get 20 or 30 percent more money, is anybody willing to pay 30 percent more for this tire? Because it is more expensive to buy that material, it's more expensive to make it. So I said, okay, how can we answer that question within, uh, some, within a few days for the least amount of money? And the engineers came up with, uh, they doctored up a tire, it was a different tire, but it looked like it could have been the one uh, uh, with the recycled material. And then they made up all these posters and so on. And they went out to a store and they actually, the engineers tried to sell this tire. And guess how many they sold? They sold not a single one because they found out that people are not willing at this time to spend 30% extra money just because the tire has recycled material in it. So the project was frozen after two weeks of work. And I think that's the idea of uh, fail fast, uh, try many things, but don't get stuck on them. And also uh, the idea of good is good enough. You don't need much to do this. Here's an example of uh, Akron Children's Hospital. They were building a new hospital and they built it in a warehouse with cardboard walls. And uh, they every day or every week they had a new setup and every week they brought beds in there. All the people involved with the with the project from the surgeon to the pipe fitter, really everybody in there to, uh, to go through this. And uh, they ran experiments. And a couple, uh, after a couple of months of doing this, they threw away all the drawings that they had and they brought a new architect in and said, we want you to draw this. And it became a much uh, cheaper hospital and a much, much uh, better hospital. Okay, let's talk about the next phase, the technology development. And uh, here's where we do science, the same way we, uh, were, we learned it in college. You define your area of research, uh, you do a literature assessment, you uh, formulate a hypothesis, and then you do your experiments, one variable at a time, and, or maybe a design of experiment. And then you confirm, refute the uh, hypothesis and uh, maybe do adjustments. Then you write a report and make recommendations. Well, in the industry, um, uh, it's here in blue, uh, you can't really afford that anymore. So um, the, the area of research is replaced by precise goals. The literature search is your knowledge reuse uh, system. Uh, sometimes you still do a hypothesis. Experiments are very uh, more efficient now, design of experiment or Taguchi methods, set-based concurrent engineering and uh, so on. And uh, Jennifer, I saw you teach PDCA, so I'm sure you know what the uh, plan, do, check, act. And then um, the report is uh, knowledge documentation in the industry. And then your recommendations are still there. But 
in the industry, reality is again different. Uh, the goals are driven by your budget. The knowledge reuse is done about 30% of the time. The hypothesis is your target. And uh, here's the biggest uh, difference. Experiments are project management now, because uh, in your experiments, you have to balance the budget, the time and the results. And uh, uh, you uh, have to engage many, many different uh, disciplines. So uh, normally um, at Goodyear, at least, it, uh, there was always a project manager assigned to this. PDCA becomes plan do. The check act, uh, we drop it because we don't have time. And the knowledge documentation is now a management presentation. And in that management presentation, leadership uh, uh, gives the recommendations uh, uh, because uh, that's still what it was when I worked in the industry. So I would like to talk about two remedies here uh, for this phase, the focus on the knowledge gaps and then uh, the set-based concurrent engineer. Uh, the set-based concurrent, here's the way I, we always did it. Um, we want to develop a new tire, so we take an existing tire, we build, test, learn, and we do many, many of those cycles, and hopefully uh, that leads us to sufficient improvement. And that worked in many cases and has been done probably for 40 years, but here's where it, uh, it started to not work anymore. Here's a case of a tire that uh, we developed for an OE customer. And you can see we start with the current product here on the performance axis and we make it better and we make it better, but we don't get to the red line that uh, the performance target. So guess what? We bring in a new variable. We bring a new uh, thread pattern now. And we uh, get better, we get better, and we see we can't make it again. So we bring in new uh, uh, materials and uh, the, the story goes on and on. Uh, in this case, uh, Goodyear made 18 iterations, did not get the customer approval. And we found out that competitors had done it in three iterations. Well, I think co uh, customers may have used this process. Uh, you take a, a large variety and uh, in fact, uh, I learned here, why don't we bring all these things in at the same time? Why do we wait uh, for um, uh, so long uh, uh, into the process? So why don't we bring all possible materials, thread patterns and everything else in from the beginning? And then we work by elimination. We eliminate the weakest, but we do this work concurrently. And then uh, 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 in order to study the interactions, we do integration events. That's where we actually build the product. And we build the product with the best options that we have at that time. And then we test the product uh, or submit it uh, to the customer. This uh, method uh, really, uh, uh, you, you start with a much broader, uh, uh, much broader uh, base, uh, much more options and you eliminate. And in fact, it becomes a much, much more efficient uh, system. It looks like you spend more time on paper but at the end, the, the success rate of this method is so much higher. And the second subject here is knowledge management. And uh, you know uh, the animal that I'm talking about here. This is an animal that scares the predators by unfolding a, uh, a scary um, array of uh, feathers here. And uh, most predators uh, run away when they see this. And there were certainly in the history, there were predators who did not run away and the animal did not survive it. But uh, those predators were rare and um, uh, the animal made it through all the evolution with this fake uh, a tail here. And uh, the only reason it did is because those predators who knew that this was a fake failed to document that. And they failed to share it with the other predators. If they had done so, this animal would be extinct, uh, extinct today. And in the industry, what do we do? Well, we don't always document what we know either. And a lot of that knowledge that we generate walks out with the people when they retire. So I show a uh, knowledge uh, management process here. I don't want to go through the details, but um, it's all about identifying knowledge gaps and then starting with your existing knowledge and make sure that the new knowledge that you create finds its way uh, uh, into a system where it's always going to be reused. 
and uh, you go from data to a database to uh, visualizing the knowledge in trade-off curves. Uh, you uh, generate mathematical relationships. Uh, you may write white papers, but at the end of the day, all that knowledge finds its way into a standard and into a design tool. And when the knowledge is there, it does not walk out with the people in their head uh, when they retire anymore. And to show you the, the power of this uh, method, um, uh, this is uh, uh, General Motors' uh, first electric car called the Volt. And um, uh, they, uh, Goodyear developed a tire for this car and there was never a car and there was never a tire. The car was developed on the computer based on existing knowledge and the tire was developed on the computer based on existing tire knowledge. And then um, uh, the model, uh, the car, the tire model was plugged into the vehicle model and Goodyear re uh, received approval for that tire and there was never a single tire built. And I think that shows you the, the power and the, another illustration of the power of this knowledge. Uh, I can't show you uh, existing uh, real pictures here for the uh, for confidentiality reasons, but Goodyear spent uh, over 100 million every year on testing. The test site in Texas was like a huge big town, busy as can be. I went there in the 80s, there were hundreds of people working there, hundreds of cars running. I went back there in uh, 2015 and it was a ghost town. There was only a few people left working there and there was only, uh, only subjective testing and a few things like that are still done there. So here we go um, over 30, over 20, 30 years of good knowledge management. Testing was almost the uh, physical testing of prototypes had been reduced to about 10% of what it used to be. And the millions of dollars are saved and uh, not even talking about the time that it's safe because you don't have to build these prototypes. You don't have to test these prototypes anymore. And then the last step in, uh, in the, the process is then the mass design. Here is where you take that, um, that successful prototype that you have now developed and you scale off that prototype hundreds of products. Like you have a car model, you have a platform and now you make all the different models and colors and accessories and uh, you name it of that uh, one platform. And um, uh, here we learned that it is really important to manage your uh, projects in small chunks. And we called it the Tetris principle here. Uh, on this graph, you see a capacity versus time. And uh, you see these blue projects, uh, those uh, are the ones that uh, that are cast in stone and then um, you fill in with, uh, with the brown ones there, like medium size and then uh, the rest is done with the small ones. And this is a, uh, actually a, a picture from Toyota, which at Goodyear didn't work because uh, you see the upper graph here, uh, it was so random uh, that uh, we could never do a big project anymore. So we had to learn to manage everything in small pieces. And now all of a sudden we could get something done because the small pieces you always find room for it. And you, uh, now you're starting to work much more efficient and much faster. And the way this worked in reality, uh, I have here the, the five big blocks there those are the typical iterations. And um, we broke those iterations down in the build uh, test steps. And uh, we picked one single schedule point, in our case, the prototype uh, manufacturing. And that's the only thing that we scheduled. And in this uh, uh, picture, you see that schedule, uh, you see the plans here listed, and uh, a tag is uh, the finish iteration uh, when it's supposed to finish and every vertical line is uh, is one week and now all of a sudden the whole big project that we could never schedule with the best possible software became just a sticky note and um, everything 1500 new SKUs every year were scheduled with uh, a board like that in the three uh, operating uh, the two innovation centers at, uh, at Goodyear. I don't want to go into the details of the process, but I want to 
show you this because uh, this is really uh, what made the whole thing work. And it still uh, blows my mind that it did work. The way we went about this, uh, changing this complete process, we, be, uh, we were behind on everything that we launched. We looked at what is the fastest way we can do this. Just that if we had only one project, and at Beauty, by the way, there are more than 1,000 uh, development projects going on at one time. So let's say we have only one project. How fast could we do this if we only had one single project? And that's the baseline that we set. And uh, five years later, every project, 1,000 uh, uh, going on at one time globally were exec executed exactly the same way in exactly the same time. And I give you a bunch of uh, lean principles here, uh, managing flow, pull, Kanban, single piece flow, theory of constraints, visual planning, and there's a lot more. The results was 100% was delivered on time. 70% reduction in cycle time, a triple, uh, a threefold gain in efficiency, and the last 100 is 100% 100 of all new products now make money. Before we did lean, about 50% of all new products uh, make money. And by the way, that is not a bad betting average for the industry, that about 50% of new products make uh, actually make money. Fortunately, companies make enough money on the other 50% that they can afford uh, that, uh, that betting average. So this brings me now to the culture part, as I said, the winning innovation is a balance of process and culture. And this, I personally learned this from Numi. Uh, Numi was a joint venture between Toyota and, uh, and General Motors. Uh, uh, Toyota management turned the worst plant that General Motors ever had into the best uh, plant that uh, General Motors ever had. And uh, I start with uh, upside down leadership. This is Billy Taylor. And Billy is in charge of all Goodyear North American manufacturing. And this is Alice. Billy works for Alice because Alice manages one of those plants that Billy is responsible for. And Alice works for these folks, Bill and Dwayne, because um, uh, Alice's job is to help Bill and Dwayne be successful. Alice would add no value if he would not help Bill and Dwayne to be successful. Billy would add no value to the company if he would not help Alice be successful. Billy doesn't tell Alice what to do. Alice doesn't tell Bill and Dwayne what to do. Alice helps them be successful. So this turns the traditional um, leadership model that we all know very well upside down. And now all of a sudden the leader helps, supports the organization, helps the organization. So the leadership transformation is going from tell the people what to do to helping people be successful. The next item on the culture that I'd like to talk about is, is respect for people. And um, for me, um, everybody comes in in the morning with the intention of doing a good job. I've never seen anybody drive to work and say, how can I screw up today? Well, screw up happens. So it's not that somebody did it intentionally people probably did their very best to avoid it, but it still happened. So if something bad happens, look at the process. Don't look at the person. Uh, it, uh, I call it uh, uh, hard on the process, but easy on the people. If something goes wrong, maybe the person wasn't trained right. Maybe the person wasn't given a chance to even be successful. Maybe the person didn't have the help that the person needed to be successful. So that's my definition of, uh, of respect. Now, respect for people leads to engagement. And uh, John Shook said uh, that at NUMI, the engagement came from the end and core. Empowering the people to stop production if they see anything wrong. Now they are not stupid um, uh, car builders anymore. Now they engage their brain and they look, how can I, make the best possible car that I can possibly do. And um, I never worked at Toyota, but I worked at Goody, and this is Bill. And Bill used to build experimental tires for me. And they were terrible, because Bill's only concern was to build 10 tires a shift, because that's what the union contract said. 
Now, uh, Bill's organization went through a lean transformation and um, about uh, 20 years later or 10 years later, I um, take a tour through, uh, I take people through Bill's uh, 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 shop there, uh, plant there. And there's Bill showing them how he builds a tire. And I saw a totally changed person. Bill now owns the machine. He's proud as can be what he does. He made changes to this machine. And at the end, when he's done with the tire, he puts his name on it. And I said, Bill, why do you put your name on it? They said, well, I want to see this tire win the next uh, Sunday at the, on the NASCAR circuit. So Bill all of a sudden is motivated to build the best possible tire, not only 10 tires a shift, but the best possible tire. And he's still a member of the same union. So what happened to Bill? Well, he didn't get paid more, he found a purpose. He gets the respect that he deserves. He owns the machine and the product and he loves to help everybody. And I'm thinking if I could go back now 20 years ago when he built those terrible tires for me, instead of dumping a spec on Bill, I should have gone out there and asked Bill, Bill, can you help me make this a better tire? What can you do? What do you know? And I bet you he would have given me anything he had but of course, there were obstacles at that time. It took about 20 years to overcome that, to get that culture to change, but they were successful doing it. So I will skip this uh, change management uh, for the in, in the interest of time now. And I want to take you back to the Vantinella Guerra, the Italian uh, bicycle company. So they doubled the value of their product portfolio in those two years that they applied innovation excellence. All new products became profitable. Quality safety uh, is still at uh, the best it possibly can be. The delivery of the innovation is 100% on time and 100% on target. Cycle time was reduced by about 75%. Efficiency increased, uh, uh, the efficiency had tripled. Engagement of the people was at an all time high. And uh, by the way, um, they, uh, at the end of the story, the, uh, the company gets uh, purchased and um, uh, of course uh, the, the owner gets his villa in, um, in, uh, in, in Sicily, but the jobs in the little town in Italy tripled after the, uh, the, the, the merge. So really what I said at the beginning, uh, 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 get the best at what you do, get the best at the, how you do it, and you will not have to be afraid of any competition in any other country in, in the world. So as I said, uh, Fausto gets his villa and um, there's a lot more to the story, by the way, but I don't have time yet to, 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 uh, to tell it all today. So uh, Jennifer says she gives me the opportunity to do a workshop on this subject where we uh, dive deeper into this and give you the rest of the story or um, uh, you can uh, you can even read about it. So that's uh, all I had to share. My email is here, my phone number. If you want to contact me, uh, be happy to answer every email or every call. Thank you so much, Norbert.